Hiya, and welcome to another episode of Dissidents and Dictators. I'm your host, Alicia Maldonado, and this week I'm joined by a special guest co-host, Javier el Chief Legal and Policy Officer at the Human Rights Foundation. Casey is busy gallivanting around the globe. While he's doing that, Javier and I will be talking about Latin America's history with dictatorship and the United States' perception of it. Javier will also regale us with his journey from being a communist to a constitutional and an international law professor and a defender of liberal democracies. Stay tuned. Javier, thank you for joining us today. How are you? Happy to be here. Thank you, Alicia, for the invitation. How do you like our Harry Styles doll? I have the only, my only relationship with anything to do with uh, hairstyles is that I take the subway at Penn Station <laughs> and many times there for like weeks on a row, they were having apparently daily concerts of hairstyles. Like yeah. this was probably last summer or a couple of summers ago. I feel like that's a good way to start at Wednesday. There honestly. you go. But I probably, I, but this, this was more on like uh, evenings though. Like not oh. evenings, like like after like 6 p.m. concerts. Huh? Like, like well, at Madison Square Garden. Oh, Oh, and Harry Styles was doing his like massive tour, or yeah, yes, his exactly. residency. I did and go to that. People were dressed uh, funny outside, and uh, that's why it made me realize, what is this? Is this like a movement, political, or what is it? It is uh, a movement. And it didn't, like I noticed, it was Harry Styles. Um, Casey, yeah, Casey's not here with us, so filling in. Maybe you'll just take over for him permanently. We don't know. Maybe we'll <laughs> allow him to come back. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> so, uh, how long have you been at HRF? Tell so I tell started at HRF. Uh, in 2000, in May 2008, I came to New York to do my an LLM, which is a master's in law uh, at Columbia University. And I met Thor around that time, the founder and currently the CEO of HRF. And um, I told him, I'm coming to Columbia, would love to volunteer for you guys. And Thor needed help. And so he said, definitely. And he hired me as a consult, as a part time consultant mm-hmm. while, I, while I was uh, um, doing my master's. But be- because um, the organization had like probably three employees or something yeah. and needed the people, he actually gave me the title of uh, general counsel already at the beginning. Love. Uh, in May as a part-time consultant, making a third of what interns do today. And that's w- what started my journey with HRF. And then when I gra- graduated a year after, uh, they helped me with my application for a work visa. And uh, and so I stayed working at HRF since. It's a, it's a It's been a long journey. It's like yeah. six years I think this summer it's gonna be 15 that's a good that's a good fair clip HRF. yeah yeah it's like it's a good place to work we're glad to have you thank you so but so where did you come from to go to school uh from Bolivia from my hometown in Bolivia which is the, the second largest city in the country probably the most um considered to be the most uh, like vibrant economically vibrant and 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 more quickly developing city it's called santa cruz de la sierra it's in the eastern part of bolivia uh it also has this kind of in the bolivian um in bolivian politics this kind of more provincial um kind of ethos and and political perspective because Mm -hmm. historically it, it was like a kind of border town with brazil that did not play a role whatsoever with like in bolivian politics that had to do typically with mining with uh, um, in that in that all the exports went through the Pacific Ocean, so the other side of the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Bolivia, just to give you an idea, lost um, in its since it became a republic in 1825, more than half of its territory, mm. and much more than half of it came from land that today is still part of Santa Cruz because it was land that was deemed completely invaluable, forgotten, no one cared if like. Uh, a neighbor country took it uh so that 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 was that that's the kind of the, the yeah. place i grew up i went to law school in um and that started me it, it gave me you know it, it, bolivian politics at the time made me interested in in constitutional law so mm, that that's yeah. what i uh worked on i was a professor for a couple of years there of constitutional law at my same law school where i graduated as a lawyer there and then uh, around that time, I applied for the Fulbright Scholarship, which is mm-hmm. uh, the U.S. Yeah. Embassy kind of runs the, Ful- the Fulbright Scholarship after teaching for a year and a half. And I got it, and it was based on that scholarship that I came you to got do a Fulbright. my master's. Yes. As a, kinda, like, as a researcher. Yeah. That's so cool. So I imagine growing up within, you know, that political system, you got a very good sense of justice. And that, is that what kind of 
Drove you to that? Uh, actually, I, more like of injustice. Injustice. Right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Better and, and like, yeah, no, the, you know, we had as many Latin American countries through the 60s and 70s, different types of dictatorships. Uh, we had particularly one big, like, kind of left-wing dictatorship, like pro kind of Castro communist dictatorship mm -hmm. uh, of General J. J. Torres, that was, that was uh, his name. Uh, I think that was in the 60s. And then, um, and then we had a few also military anti-communist dictatorships uh, in the 70s, late mm -hmm. 70s. Um, in the early 80s, 80, 81, we had, a, it was, I guess, also an anti-communist dictatorship, but mostly just a you know, military dictatorship that was also very, very much taken over by or controlling the drug trade in Bolivia, which is huge. Bolivia is one, along with... Uh, Colombia and Peru is one of the three biggest product, uh, producing countries of uh, cocaine. Oh. So you've just seen the movie uh, Scarface. There's a Bolivian uh, drug lord that they, that the Scarface guy, like <laughs> Al Pacino visits <laughs> and all of that. So that, that, that's, that was Bolivia. So this I didn't know that Bolivia could claim that. Yeah, and this government particularly was very, 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 like this military government was uh, was very pro kind of trafficking and and. and so what happened is that government eventually led to a transition to democracy where um, where a coalition of left-wing parties took over in 1982, or left-wing democratic parties. Um, I mean, there were at the time the people that probably more fervent, fervently believed in democracy because they had been in the receiving end of a dictatorship, so they, they wanted democracy. And so this coalition called... La UDP, the Unión Democrática Popular, the Democratic and Popular Union, in, in 1982 took over. Um, and they governed for three years. Because they did not understand economics, they thought their ideas, you know, that's, a, that's the thing. Like, they, they were persecuted by a dictatorship, but their economic ideas, uh, they, they, they were wrong, right? Like, mm -hmm. So they literally implemented all the policies that they, that they thought were best for the country, uh, policies that today you would, you know, qualify uh, like consider them uh, socialist policies. Mm -hmm. Although they were very popular in the, in the Americas at the time, generally, like not just by literally like by bar Marxist people, but like by folks like Fernando Enrique Cardoso, the substitution of exports. Mm -hmm. For folks like today, I consider to be center right. They 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 defended those policies at the time. Anyway, they implemented those policies, and so by 1985, Bolivia had an inflation a hyperinflation that was historic, like only Austria in 1810 or something had had an inflation that bad. Wow. So much so that um, that the country was essentially uh, in ruins because of that. So when I went to law school, Evo Morales wins the election when I was probably close to finishing law school. And I, for the first time, see in the in, in Bolivian recent history a government that is actively, like mm. actively, is saying that they admire a dictatorship. In, right. in this case, it was the the Cuban dictatorship uh, that they admire the dictatorship and that they want to take the country in that direction, and that everything that was done before was wrong, and that the, the country needed a refounding uh, under the principles of mm -hmm. the Cuban Revolution, essentially, and so. I realized for the first time that I, I had been spoiled, that I had lived in a country that was democratic for since 1982, mm -hmm. uh, right? And since I was born in 1982. So I lived my entire life under a democratic government, like most Bolivians. And it wasn't a perfect government, you know. When, when Evo Morales takes over, there is clearly a, Evo a process of erosion of democracy. He, Evo Morales was, is a coca union leader, coca, the plant that, mm -hmm. that is used to produce cocaine. Um, that he was a union leader and not popular at all. Uh, you know, a person that would get 0.2% of the vote every election. And uh, But he became very popular. Um, funny enough, the, what made him the most popular was that he got, I think, one election, he got like 10 or 15% of the vote. And the ambassador of the United States in Bolivia, which is the same person that current that just recently a person by the name Rocha that just yes. recently got indicted in the U.S. for being a, a Cuban a, agent. A spy, yeah. Casey, they so talked I about wonder, that. I wonder if he was a spy at the time, but he definitely acted as a spy because he came on national television and said, do not vote for Evo Morales. If Bolivia votes for Evo Morales, the U.S. is going to stop aid or whatever yeah, yeah. In, 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 in the drug trade like kind of fight. Yeah. 
you know, the, in the, the, Latin America has a love-hate relationship, kind of definitely politicians with the U.S. on the one yeah. hand. They, they admire the U.S., envy the U.S. for the progress. Essentially, the U.S. is just as young a country as most of Latin America. They were, you know, uh, you know, Europeans got to the U.S. 100 years after they got to Latin America. And so culturally, they're younger than in, in, in that yeah. sense than, than Latin America. And yet they're more developed, more... There's well, a good book. There's an interesting book by Professor Francis Fukuyama, actually, mm, who spoke at yeah. the Oslo Freedom Forum, right? Uh, it's called... Uh, it's, uh, I can't recall the book, but it's about the, the development gap, um, the development gap between Latin, I think it's left behind or something like that, but the development gap between Latin America and the U.S. So there is that kind of love-hate relationship that says I get this admiration, sort of envy of the U.S., but there is also a big anti-U.S. you know US feeling that politicians sometimes can't exploit. How does that square, though? So Latin America has a long history with dictatorship. Can you first talk about, like, you know, what is the attraction or the affliction to dictatorship and, and kind of explain the nuance between so many dictatorships there and then also that kind of dance or flirtation with the United States being, you know, probably one of the biggest democracies or the... Going back to the, the story of, of, of when Evo Morales wins an election in Bolivia, I mean, partly because of this help from the U.S. embassy that, that made him become more popular. So people on the left was like, okay, like, which is 50% of the country as most, in most normal societies. And so they were like, okay, we're going to vote for this guy now in order to stick it to, 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 to the gringos. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, that, so he wins an election and again, it's, it's, it's not your normal. And what, what year was that that he won the election? I think it was 2005. Okay. So he's been uh, in power so since then. 2004, yeah, 2005. And, and I mean, he was in power until he committed fraud and not, but his party is back in power. There was a short hiatus of one year of, uh, an attempt of a transition to democracy that did not work for many mistakes of the opposition. And mm -hmm. now the more, the Evo Morales party is back in power. Funny enough, because he himself wants to be the leader of his party and he's lost control right. over it, now he's fighting and he's the main opposition <laughs> to the current, to essentially his successor that was his So minister. he's fighting his own successor. He's, fight, he's fighting his own successor. This is like Putin and Medvedev. Let's suppose Medvedev actually had stayed in power in mm -hmm. Russia okay. and then Putin would be fighting him in order to come back. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what's happening in, in So it's, in it's Bolivia, not right? even about uh, ideology or belief. It's... Power clearly hunger. about power. It's yeah. clearly about power. It's transparently about power. But it's not. A, I actually want to be, you know, the head of this country for these reasons and to help my common man. It's. I really just want all of it mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. myself. Exactly. And, and and look, it's interesting because that 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 uh, hybrid authoritarian regime was still considered Bolivia a hybrid authoritarian regime. You can call it a competitive authoritarian regime, as in it's not a full fledged dictatorship. Right. Okay. Uh, but it's also not a democracy because of specific signs and erosion of the, the democratic system that that prevents you from calling it a full fledged. And that's democracy. a classification that we use here at HRF, exactly. which is to have hybrid. Uh, you have to have at least some semblance of a rule of law. So exactly. free and fair elections, at least you know. Correct. The Im the image of giving your opposition right. the chance to run, although they're definitely not going to win. And so that's how we right. kind of break that down. Right. So you kind of fuse the two. And if we want to be even more technical, more like definitely not want to win is in a dictatorship, they definitely not going to win. Yeah. Like the opposition are definitely not going to win. In, yeah. a, in, a, in a democracy, it, sorry, in a hybrid authoritarian regime, and this is the terminology that we're using for a tyranny tracker project that tracks all the countries around the world, is uh, it's... It, it, it's, it could possibly win, but it's very unlikely yeah. to win. Like, the, the rules of the game are not fair. It's very one-sided already institutionally. So the opposition may possibly win, but it's very, very unlikely. It's like that they did in Venezuela. You can definitely run, but we're also going to halt all the buses so you can't actually get to the ballot. Exactly. Yeah, Exactly. And to the point that in Venezuela, for example, we, all, we already consider Venezuela a full-fledged dictatorship because... It goes beyond the, the 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 level of abuse goes beyond of really allowing a lack, likelihood for the opposition to win and the rules of the game. So when when that happens two three times and it's so transparent, then then we don't call it a hybrid authoritarian regime and we call it mostly a dictatorship. But Bolivia, let's say, it's still in Latin America is the only hybrid authoritarian regime. I mean, El Salvador more. Which one's the only hybrid? Bolivia Bolivia's, right now okay. we consider it hybrid authoritarian. And but that's the only El, one in El Salvador is a big candidate that might get there very soon. It's okay. already doing doing uh, working hard to get there. That's a hybrid authoritarian <laughs> regime under Bukele. I mean obviously he's very popular. He's done 
arguably, you know, good things for his population when it comes to fighting the gangs. But at the same time, the methods he's used for for what what, what, what we've seen, press reports, etc., seem to be too sweeping, too um, too careless of actual individual rights for the people that are being investigated uh, and in prison, etc. So uh, it 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 in in his just general kind of bullish um, attitude and how he speaks and how he addresses the opposition, etc. It looks it is he has all the the hallmarks of of, of, of a typical Latin American caudillo. Mm-hmm soon to become dictator. And yeah. in fact, he put, I mean, this is more of a response to his critics that he put on his Twitter account, I think, Salvadoran dictator, when they, like, uh, <laughs> as, a, as a self own it, Own it as a joke, but own also, it but a, it's true. But it's true, but yeah. it's true. So he, so he already changed the rules of the game in order to get reelected. So that already puts him close to being considered, for, from our perspective, a high return regime. The reason we haven't, we didn't call it right away. Is that we you need to to wait at least for one election to to do that. But uh, it's it's something that that might happen in the next uh, in the next few months that we might consider him a, a hybrid time regime fully. I mean, we we're hoping to launch our actually our actual tyranny tracker sometime in 2025, uh, which would be you know something for the public to to see and like see how we classify every single country in the world and what are the what are what's our thinking behind uh whether we're calling a country a democracy a hybrid regime or a or a dictatorship yeah and so but going back this is a perfect example to kind of explain what i was saying about dictatorships in Latin america yeah we're still like as if in anywhere in the world, like uh, anywhere in the world, there is generally this notion of a left wing side and a yeah. right wing side. Yeah. Communist or self considered communist government starting t- started taking over since Russia, nineteen seventeen, and and so on and, mm-hmm. and so forth. And the first big one in Latin America being obviously the Cuban Revolution. Uh, but throughout the Cold War, the left has been considered to be more socialist, more um, mm-hmm. and it's in its more radical expression, a communist dictatorship potentially. Whereas the right has deemed to be more like conservative, generally more nationalist, and on its more radical expression to the right, uh, a military anti-communist dictatorship willing to do everything from you know rounding up and killing to around two hundred people, like I think the the Bolivian dictatorship did in nineteen seventies, anti-communist dictatorship of Banzer. And then in Pinochet, I don't know if it's a thousand people that, that, that he killed or maybe a little less, but mm-hmm. he, so he was more you could say uh, less massive in the, in the in the amount of killings, but equally brutal, yeah. like uh, and not and, inconsequential, and not inconsequential at all. And then all the way to the Argentinian anti-communist dictatorship, which is the most infamous, probably uh, and most well known around the world because of the apparent amount of the people that they killed. It's estimated at uh, around thirty thousand people potentially, and mm-hmm. it includes you know. Pretty brutal ways of disappearing them, throwing them to the ocean alive, and mm-hmm. things like that. Uh, have you seen some of this in the movie Argentina, nineteen eighty-five? That uh-huh. I think won an Oscar or was close to winning an Oscar last year. Uh, where Moreno Campo was the first uh, prosecutor of the ICC. He was the kind of second prosecutor in command during that, those trials of the military junta in Argentina. So mm-hmm. that's the right in Latin America and the left in Latin America. The U.S. Uh, tends to romanticize one side of things, uh, not the U.S., yeah. but mostly Latin American studies professors yeah. in the United States tend to kind of romanticize the the the, the Che Guevara side, uh, proof of which <laughs> is the fact yep. that Hollywood has 100%. produced more Che Guevara movie, movies in the past probably 10 years or 20 years than they have produced anything about Do, any democracy are, in Latin America. Are they accurate at all? No, they're not accurate. Obviously. I mean, they're, they're a romanticized why, version of a dictator. It's like you could why, do the why same over. Why the romanticization, do you reckon? It's a romanticization because it's, and it's also a U.S.-based romanticization because Che Guevara, as most dictators have, criticism of the U.S. system, some of which is fair. Like, for example, China, you see it, they do it at every U.N., human rights meeting that they participate in, they say the U.S. has the highest rate of incarceration than any country in the world. And that count, that includes dictatorship, something like that, mm-hmm. right? Like, uh, and I don't have the numbers on me, but it makes sense that U.S. has an issue with over-incarceration. Uh, so, yes, it's a country for law and order and rule of law, but it there there's an argument to say not, not every province will get fixed by sending someone that, you know, had an armed robbery for 40 years. Yeah. And, 
five, five, five life sentences and things like that. Like it, it can be a little bit, a little too much uh, sometimes. So, so yes, you there are things that are criticized of the U.S. system. When Che Guevara was around, he said he criticized things like the fact that there there was uh, racism in the South and specific episodes, you know. Uh, lynchings, things like that. Like so, he was very smart in in criticizing the defects of the mm -hmm. U.S. democracy, uh, and that was one of the reasons that I think make make him a a, a, a likable character mm -hmm. by the left in the United yeah. States, right? The, the reasonable left, if you will, like yeah. in the United States, right? That's one thing. Another thing is uh, the Cuban dictatorship. So the 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 true thing that at the beginning the reality is that Fidel Castro portrayed himself. In interviews openly, and also the people that were with him in his movement that, that won the revolution in 1959, but that started, this campaign started in 1956, so throughout the year, those years, they were a pro-democracy movement fighting a dictatorship, mm -hmm. like uh, fighting the Batista dictatorship. So they were smart at selling themselves as a liberation democracy movement. However, what they do not emphasize is that after after i mean right after winning the revolution they they became they aligned themselves with russia with like the communist regime of russia and they became a totalitarian uh dictatorship so when che guevara was giving his speeches at the un and he was becoming famous for being che guevara he was actually actively executing people in cuba incarcerating mm -hmm. anyone that disagreed including mm -hmm. people for being religious and anyone really that opposed communism and so he he was the face of uh Of, of this dictatorship and he became having been killed in Bolivia interestingly after kind of after after working in Cuba as a as a, as a bureaucrat and and being as the canciller the secretary of state would be in the US of mm -hmm. you know traveling mm -hmm. representing the Cuban dictatorship around the world uh, he 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 essentially decided to go back to the trenches become again a revolutionary a guerrilla guy And he went to Bolivia to do this. I mean, theory is that Fidel Castro did not like him at that point because he was becoming too popular for his liking. Um, and he stopped supporting it. Part of that probably is true. Uh, the reality is that he got killed in Bolivia by the military because mm. he was literally killing Bolivian soldiers in his quest of liberating <laughs> Bolivia from from being uh, a non-communist country. So, and that's... By eliminating its people. Yeah, and so and so he got... He, he, He got killed, but like so. This, this, the real. I mean, the truth is, and, and not for Latin America, but for the world and the way we see the world. That at the Human Rights Foundation, and it's the pro democracy organization, is that dictatorships come in all colors. They are generally perceived to be either right wing or left wing. Because yeah, I was going to say you, you mentioned that work. like most dictatorships are, or Latin American dictatorships are left wing. I, I mean, mean today, 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 today. I mean, in the '60s, in the '70s, even in the '80s. Most dictatorships were actually right-wing dictatorships. They were perceived, and they were, in fact, you know, more on the right of the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, so people that are on the right of the political spectrum were called to make decisions of, do I support the dictator because he eliminates my worst enemies, which are the, the, the communists, mm -hmm. or do I actually believe in democracy and do I hate the dictator because of being because it's abusive and it's just not eliminating the communists, mm -hmm. but in the process of creating the incentives that 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 dictatorships create they also uh carry out untold injustices against a lot of innocent people that are not necessarily you know radical left-wing mm -hmm. communist like in the case of a right-wing dictatorship so the same happens with a left-wing dictatorship they're not just fighting yes at the beginning they say oh we're fighting the fascists and the nazis yeah good but then yeah. then it turns out they're just fighting anyone that disagrees with them and that involves a lot of fair people innocent people that have are not even ideological and that's that's what's the problem with, a slippery with dictatorships essentially uh it's that uh um they don't just fight like the radicals on the other side of the political spectrum they end up taking over and fighting any reasonable person uh that, that opposes them and so um But today, yes, uh, today, I mean, Latin America had a democratic democratization period started in the 80s, but I think it became total, like all of Latin America, at least Spanish-speaking and Portuguese-speaking mm -hmm. Latin America, became democratic through the 90s. Um, some international norms reflected this, like at the Organization of American States, which is kind of like the UN for Latin America that... Um, For the Americas, it includes Canada and the U.S., uh, they passed 
international treaties. Specifically, they reformed the organization, the OAS Charter, to include being democratic as one obligation of mm -hmm. Latin American mm -hmm. countries. So the notion is dictatorships are bad, and if you become a dictatorship, you should be expelled from this organization. Right. And obviously what people, what most people had in mind at the time were two kinds of dictatorships. It was the right, typical right-wing military dictatorship, right. although Cuba obviously, even though it was left-wing, it was also, it's, it's also a, a military, military dictatorship. Presence, yeah. um, and on the other hand, it had the, the idea of, of a democratically elected government that after being elected be erodes democracy to a point that it turns it into a dictatorship or a hybrid, what we call a hybrid mm -hmm. authoritarian regime. Mm -hmm. And that was the case of Fujimori in Peru. Um, and so after Fujimori in the 90s, they also passed another international um, norm called the, the Inter-American Democratic Charter that made it even emphasize more on this obligation in the Americas. And it was meant to include, again, your, your military dictatorship that takes over through a coup d'etat, as, mm -hmm. well, as well as your democratically elected caudillo that takes over and eventually turns the country into an authoritarian regime, which is what uh, Fujimori had done in, okay. in, in Peru. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's what eventually Evo Morales did is in Bolivia. It's, it's, it, it, although it didn't take it to the point of be, making it a full-fledged dictatorship, in our opinion at least, um, generally, Latin America is a, it has mostly left-wing dictatorships today. It's Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Bolivia that we consider to be a hybrid authoritarian regime, and they all happen to be more on the left side of the political spectrum, or are perceived to be on the le on the left-wing side of the political spectrum internationally. Let's say, is it a pendulum? Do you think that you know, but you know, the slide it seems the sliding scale between. D mm -hmm. democracy and then sliding back into di dictatorship and then inching forward, as you said, that, you know, like Bolivia and El Salvador is a hybrid. So in trying to inch its way back toward democracy after being, is it just continually like that or, I, you know? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, I don't, I don't know if I have a clear answer on it. I think uh, the danger of a particular democratic society of turning into a dictatorship by essentially modernly that means electing a person mm -hmm. that then becomes a dictator right uh, I think that's that's a danger that exists in every democratic society what makes Latin America different to the United States for example mm -hmm. is that it's easier for a caudillo that takes over or you can call it a populist a demagogue mm -hmm. uh, what are a very popular radical on one side of the political spectrum or by radical I don't mean Necessary. He has radical political. The ideas. American kind of perspective. I mostly, I mostly, no. By radical, I mean someone that goes. It's kind of like what Millet does in Argentina. I, I like the economics. Let's say ideas of Millet. I generally, the, my, my intellectual evolution may, has made me more of. A, and I'd love to get to it. Of a, of a, of a person that understands economic freedom, believes in economic freedom, mm -hmm. understands the price system, understands that a lot of government act, government action aimed at intervening in the economy ends up. Uh, being, uh, you know, making the economy worse for the poorest people yeah. in society. So because of that, let's say yeah. I like the that side of uh, of um, Millet's, you know, perspective on 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 on, on, on economics. But um, yeah, his th there is no doubt to me being you know exposed to politics and and promoting democracy and thinking what things make a, a society more democratic, etc. There's no doubt to me that the reason he, he was elected president, that a lot of people voted for him, is not just because they like his economic uh, ideas, but it's because uh, he calls the other side of the political spectrum, which is the left in Latin America, yeah. he calls them openly and while yelling, surdos de mierda, vaya a ser like he, he does, like surdos de mierda means, surdos is people on the left, so left-wing dudes, lefties, Surdo se mierda, it's fucking lefties. T tremble, he says, like, surdo se mierda, tiembling. So he's like, tremble. So that's that part is a sh partisan perspective, mm -hmm. similar to, say, the perspective of populists in America, like Trump. So mm -hmm. he goes to the microphone and finally starts calling the left, like exposing the left in a particular way, calling them names, and people like that. And they say, like, oh, this is my hooligan. Finally, someone that really, really believes the way I, like, sees this other side the way I see it. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the peril, like, so the existence of populists that are going to take one of the sides because they're very popular in that they attack the other side 
very you know bluntly mm -hmm. and without nuances and without mm -hmm. respect and mostly just abusing them like you would abuse them like as a bully in the like whatever or mm -hmm. vice versa right like mm -hmm. it's popular both ways it can be bernie sanders or aoc against the right or it yeah. can be trump against the left uh but it's it's a similar thing that happens also in latin america that's the way bukele acts that's the way uh, Evo Morales acted, that's the way Milet acts, that's the way Lula mm -hmm. acts, that's the way a lot of people act. So what makes the difference is how, f between the different countries is, how far are these populist, let's call them, leaders willing to go in actually right. eroding institutions to the point of turning his, their country into a dictatorship? Right. That's one side of the equation. And the other side of the equation is, how strong are these institutions in these particular countries mm -hmm that will prevent this from happening. And by strong, I mean how independent they are, what is the history of independence of these institutions. So that gives you the answer on why it's easier for populist people, populist leaders taking over in Latin America to, in turning the countries into a dictatorship. It's easier there than in the U.S. Why? Because in the U.S., um, first of all, there's federalism. So there's 50 legal orders essentially with their own rules, their own police, their own like judges, courts, etc. You know, for Trump, during Trump's administration, there were a lot of his mo more, most controversial policies were taken down by judges that probably were appointed by by center left governments back in mm -hmm. the day. But that, that that provides a check on the on the current administration, right? Like and it goes both ways. It's right. like now with the Biden administration Right. And so and so on and so forth. So these are entrenched legal tradition, you could call them, or just rule of law, uh, institutional strength, right? Independence mm -hmm. that makes it very difficult to even a very forceful populist uh, Bukele type or, you know, uh, of, or Lula type or Evo Morales type person uh, to take over completely. But in Latin America, it's, very, it's much easier once you take over to do away with the entire, to, to hold on to power and turn the country into a full-fledged dictatorship very quickly because, because, because again, the tradition of uh, institutional strength is much less, um, much less ingrained. And, and, and so that's, that's the risk. And that's why, a hundred, like 200 years, uh, the U.S. has remained a democracy with all its defects while, while Latin America has had all sorts of pendulums of, I mean, the pendulum has swung very strongly both ways and had different periods of dictatorial regimes. To dig a little bit deeper on Latin America kind of um, tradition of caudillos is, this, this is a culture that has, ha that has been part of Latin American culture for like since the 1800s. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we split in so many countries that we decided to be born as, instead of creating like a big federation, uh, of like the U.S. did mm -hmm, with the, mm -hmm. originally the 13 colonies and then eventually the United States. Instead of creating a big federation in a Urban huge continent, we we split up in, in different republics. Mm -hmm. And so this did not, I don't think, help the potential for stability. And right. Yeah, we went through all the 1800s. We were at war with each other, essentially, in Latin America, uh, national wars. And just like the U.S. had the Mexico, the U.S.-Mexico skirmishes, mm -hmm. war, et cetera, the same Latin America had with each other. And that was not obviously helpful. It's also something that incentivizes strongmen, military guys taking over, right, having wars in, in the 1800s. You had said uh, that w between the ages of 19 and 20, you were a communist. Um, and part of that was because of um, English language biographies of Che and, and some other books you'd read. I'd love to hear about that. So did so the United States' romanticization of Che had an influence on you, would you say? W exactly. And actually, one thing I didn't mention, I think I started reading Che Guevara biographies when I was already a communist. Okay. And what made okay. me, but what made me more of a communist is, like, I was, let's say my dad, I think, historically voted for center-left parties, I would say, within Bolivian democracy, obviously. Okay. Uh, it wasn't because he was a, he had a particular view on economics, but I think he liked more the economic equality kind of speech and, mm -hmm. and let's take care of the poor. He liked that approach that a little better. Spoke than spoke to him like, Spoke clearly. to him a little more. So it wasn't really anything elaborate. So I would say I, so in Bolivia, having not had communism and having uh, only had some right-wing dictatorships, like definitely we did not have 
anti-communist immunity, kind of like Venezuela too. Venezuela having not had a communist dictatorship and only having had right-wing dictatorships, it was an, a, a more fertile ground for someone like Chavez mm -hmm. to, to eventually win an election. So um, so let's say I, I definitely had not, did not grow up hearing horror stories about communism, like right, uh, right. how horrendous it is. So that's that's one of the reasons I even became communist at some point, right? Because right. if I had like heard those stories before, probably I would have had that immunity. Anyway, I came to the U.S. when I was 18 to do, uh, as part of an exchange program after graduating from high school, I did, I worked with the U.S. Forest Service in Colorado. They did a, like, oh, I did not know that. It was the, US, the Student Conservation Association. Colorado kind of internship for like six months in Colorado. And most of my friends, I'm not going to say they were communists. They were not. <laughs> they really were not. They were just like liberal people in the U.S. Yeah. that were born more. Many of them, I remember one of them was from Vermont, et cetera. <laughs> Nor these uh, folks uh, yeah. that like the environment and help the environment and biodiversity. And yeah, yeah. Get a lot of the, that in Colorado. Work for the Forest Service for not a lot of money. So definitely, definitely they're not prioritizing becoming Rich, rich in life right. yeah. uh, and so they were they, these were my friends in Colorado and like that were from different parts of the country that were working with the Forest Service there and I remember one of them one of the ones that I really liked the most I remember one of them asked me what's your take on Che Guevara I heard he was killed in Bolivia and for me I mean this was kind of pre-internet there was yeah. already some chats like Merck and things like that but like <laughs> it's not something that I could like quickly brush up on in the evening and come up I with come a up good with answer a good, the next dissertation day. Tomorrow. So I was yeah. like, you know what? That's a very good question. I really don't know. I think, yeah, I think he was killed in Bolivia, but I'm not familiar really. And But that caught my attention that I should brush up on this guy yeah. and start reading about it. So yes, there you go. That You have a perfect example of how having, been, having grown up in Bolivia in a family that's not particularly intellectual. My dad's not a writer. Not overly not political a, either. Overly political either. I really knew that this guy was a guerrilla guy that was killed, but I was not aware much of his politics, his ideas, right. his, the history of it. So Why that caught that? my attention. When I came back to Bolivia, I started doing a little bit more research about that. And also someone recommended a book. It was called The Open Veins of Latin America by a very famous Uruguayan author. He re kind of recanted the topic of his, like the book in the New York Times, just like, Wow. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. He said he was dumb when he wrote it. Anyway, that's a very, <laughs> it was well. very influential book, though, and in that essentially when you read it, it's so one-sided, but it's it's well written, but mm -hmm. it's so one-sided that it it's it's almost impossible to drop that book, and 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 not become come a away communist. with the ideas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's it's so powerful that in fact I would say the most powerful intellectual on the center right or perceived to be on the center right, although he's just an independent brilliant and amazing person, like Mario Vargas Llosa, mm -hmm. uh, who's a Nobel Literature Prize winner, he, he wrote a book in response to the open veins of Latin America, and it's called The Manual, and I think it was translated as The Guide of the Perfect Latin American Idiot. Uh, <laughs> in, Sp in, in Spanish, it's El Manual del Perfecto Idiota Latinoamericano. But it's, it gives you, you know, an idea of the importance of, 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 uh, of open veins of Latin America. So I read that. That made me more like open to Marxist ideas. I started actually reading some Marxist Leninist stuff. Like I re read, remember the German ideology by Marx and Engels, which is one book of essays mm -hmm. in which they collaborated before writing the Capital. I didn't read the the, the Capital for, for sure, but like there was a, there was enough of his basic ideas in Marxist ideology that made me feel that you know what this is kind of the truth, right, in terms yeah. of political ideas. And I, so for around a year in the university, it didn't help that most of my professors uh, did not have an answer for my, whenever, you know, we got yeah. to discuss any of that. I'm not going to say every professor, but like, let's say philosophy, when we were, we, we had a legal philosophy class, that was probably a place mm -hmm. to discuss these things. And I, their responses didn't satisfy me. There was one professor, though, whose responses did satisfy me. And he had, he was also had been a Marxist at some point back in his life in the 70s, I think, environmental law professor, had worked with Alan Garcia, and he actually had read and he was aware enough of the mistakes of socialism generally, mm -hmm. Marxist Leninism mm -hmm. in particular, you know, price controls, all the, the, the economic problems of mm -hmm. socialism. Mm -hmm. 
And so he was, he, he responded to me, he engaged with me. When I came up with something, he was like, yeah, I, I get it, but he just swatted look, down at all what, of your bad ideas. look at what yeah, the Cuban revolution actually has done. Look at this, 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 and that. And mm -hmm. having a friendly person, because that's an important thing too. Right. Having someone from the other team that tells you, yes, I'm from the blue team. You're from the red team. I hate you because you suck. And like that doesn't get yeah. you out of where you are. So it's very and important. And it entrenches you too. You, yeah. It entrenches you the most. But like, exactly. So you have to have someone that said, you know what? I used to be in your team. I was on the red team. Now I'm more of an independent but I'm generally a liberal, like I, uh, not a, a liberal in the a classical, the classical liberal sense, yeah. in the in the in Latin American sense. Like I'm a, I'm a person that believes in in econo in political freedom. I'm a person that believes that there should be a left and a right mm -hmm. that fight for power and whatever in open elections, democratic elections. But like that, that that this professor came, kind of was a person that I could identify with and say, okay, this guy does not hate me for for wanting to change things. The, the, the reason is he's, he just actually understands this so much so that he was kind of in my position many years ago. And so that that gave me the strength to kind of become also a, a classical liberal person on, on political ideas. So I was a Democrat, a yeah. true Democrat, a person that believed in democracy at that point. And because of that, obviously I became immediately an anti-Cuban dictatorship person because it's, it's it's yeah. it was enough for me to 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 start like being consistent in I am anti right wing dictatorship as much as I am anti left wing dictatorship and that was like kind of my first kind of awakening uh, and this was still in law school so by the time I graduated I wrote uh, a book a legal book about the perils of the Evo Morales administration actually eroding into a Fidel Castro type dictatorship. Mm -hmm. uh, And using like using international law as the main argument, international human rights law, international democracy law, international investment law. So that this book made my career over the first few years in Bolivia, and this, that's what led eventually for me to, to me winning the Fulbright scholarship. This is the book that I handed Thor. He happened to be in Bolivia in May 2008. I met him on a meeting and I handed that's him so a copy cool. of my book, and that was the context. I handed him a copy of my book and told him. I'm going to be doing a master's at Columbia, so I'll be in New York. I'd like to volunteer for you guys. And that's that's where so we have his a, offer to... We have a professor who is friendly but spoke reason to you to thank for dropping the shackles in front one, of your eyes. Exactly. I mean, the first person. I'm sure that I would have the encountered other, other yeah. elements uh, that would have gotten me out of that uh, but uh, later. But but at the time, it was that. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. It's just so hard to imagine that, that um, you know... That you could that that someone could live kind of in that belief system for so long, you know. I, I just it's true. I think that, that it's almost impossible in a way. Mm -hmm. Crazy, you would imagine in a country that that, but it's not so crazy. Why? Because you know, part of being part of your the left wing identity is also to oppose a right wing dictatorship. So it's easy to rally people around that idea, and then the slippery slope of going from there to saying Fidel Castro, the other side, is actually better and so much better because of X Y Z is not so so far fetched and. It's very, very easy for the pendulum to, to become more sense. radical. And the same in, in Latin America. You can have a certain point in time, center left, center right, people are brilliant, and then suddenly a populist wins that hates the center, -right, center right, center right people, that actually uh, you're criticizing them openly, and suddenly like a more radical uh, intellectual becomes their, their or, or they themselves become their, their movement leader. So uh, that's that kind of peril and exists in every society and it's, it's not so surprising that now with the emergence again of, of, of social media of the internet like it's 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 not surprising that that we're we have this this kind of process of radicalization polarization in in in, in democratic societies um it, it's 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 normal um mm -hmm. but also i mean but that's why these spaces need to exist yeah spaces like this podcast etc so that we can You know, have these conversations, and I, I, I certainly learned a lot today. Persuade people to not, <laughs> to not follow the radicals on either side. You heard it here first. But yeah. I, I still respect and, and mostly empathize with a lot of people, particularly in Latin America, that in the 70s were very center-left or, or more like radical-left, became radical-left as a result, some of them, of the existence of right-wing dictatorships. Yeah. And so I empathize with those people, and it's it's it, at the end of the day, politicians tend to be very pragmatic. Uh, and if 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 they feel that implementing a certain kind of policy is gonna make them more likely to win 
an election in a few years, uh, they'll do it. If they're true Democrats. If not, they probably just focused on on arming up and and beefing up the, 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 the repressive side of the governments and just yeah. uh, going after the opposition. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for joining me, Javier. I wish I could have spoken to you in some Spanish during this podcast. Uh, pero mi padre por el canyon no me enseño. <laughs> My father didn't teach me. I'm eternally <laughs> bitter about this. I know he's listening, so, you know, shout out, Dad. Thanks. Um, I like to bring this up all the time. Whenever I talk to my father, I end the most conversations with th saying, thank you for not teaching me Spanish. And I learned that one little phrase, when I was living up in Washington Heights, people would come up to me all the time and t start talking to me in Spanish. And sometimes I could understand them, like, you know, if they, within the context, you know. Um, but people would just say, but aren't you Puerto Rican? And I, I just was always surprised by that, because I've always <laughs> thought I looked like my British mother. Um, and so I learned how to say my Puerto Rican father did not teach me Spanish. So when people said that to me in the, in the Heights, I would just say that. He, he definitely, he, he inherited, well, he gave you a very, very Spanish last name and yeah. not cared to teach us. Didn't name. follow through on the rest. It, look, if he had said, take your, to your mother's <laughs> last name, it would have been okay. Like, no one would have ever, <laughs> like, right. asked you to speak Spanish. But I know, I remember, because when I first met you, I think I spoke to you in Spanish. You did, yeah. Because I presume you must speak at least some Spanish. <laughs> If your name I is. I think I, I could understand what you were saying to me, but I just couldn't respond in it. So, you know, when I go visit my family in Puerto Rico, my auntie, she always talks to me in Spanish. I can, and she speaks great English, but she'll speak to me in Spanish and I'll follow her and I'll do the thing that she's asked me to do and then realize that I've, I've understood it, but just have no Spanish to say back, which I find <laughs> so infuriating. So. It makes but, you feel better. My last name is Lebanese, so no one ever spoke to me but in the US yes in fact you know Celine who I met during my masters and she's at Columbia and of now HRF. is the president of HRF I, I remember she's the one that be, I mean she became she my friend because, because she recognized my last name that it was a Lebanese last name I'm pretty sure she spoke first time it's like are you Lebanese and she probably spoke Arabic to me and I was like no I'm actually from Bolivia <laughs> I mean she's also smart enough that she knows that like obviously yeah. there's a huge Lebanese community in Latin America and like obviously it was something we, we became very good friends. Uh, I love that. After it. Yeah, I love you, Dad. Just tease me. Yeah. <laughs> it's still better. Don't forget it. It's still better. All right. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next week. The Human Rights Foundation is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that promotes and protects human rights globally with a focus on closed societies. We promote freedom where it's most at risk in countries ruled by authoritarian regimes.